This screencast will cover gastrointestinal tubes, commonly encountered. At the end of this module, you should be able to identify and describe the appropriate position of the different GI catheters you will encounter and the common and correct positions. I also want you to know the appropriate next step in management for handling a misplaced or suboptimal tube. Let's look at some basic anatomy. Most tubes are placed either through the nose or through the mouth. The biggest obstacle for placement of a enteric or gastric tube is getting past the epiglottis. Stimulation of the posterior nasopharynx or oropharynx can cause a gag reflex. When you are placing a tube, having the patient actively swallow can overcome that gag reflex and allow for the tube to pass into the esophagus. Coiling in the nasopharynx is a common occurrence when placing tubes, and this often occurs when the patient is gagging due to tube placement. Now take a look at this example in a trauma patient. This chest radiograph was taken immediately after initial resuscitation. We can see a nasogastric tube that terminates over the mediastinum. This catheter from the level of the nose appeared to have been placed fully when we look at their topogram from their CT, we can see this catheter coiled multiple times in the mouth and the neck. So this is a nasogastric tube that's coiled in the oral pharynx. It will have to be removed and repositioned. Here is another example where a chest x-ray was obtained after nasogastric tube placement. We do not see a nasogastric tube passing down the mediastinum. Instead, we see loops of the nasogastric tube up over the neck. And again, this is a nasogastric tube coiled within the oropharynx and upper esophagus. It needs to be removed and then replaced. The worst thing to happen when placing a GI tube is tracheal intubation. This occurs when there isn't proper laryngeal elevation and protection of the trachea by the epiglottis. One difficulty in distinguishing tracheal versus esophageal intubation on an initial radiograph after placement of a GI tube is that the trachea and the esophagus overlap for a considerable period of time. Until the tube has been passed beyond the crina, it is difficult to discern where the catheter is located. When the catheter does pass beyond the carina, we can be confident of its location within the esophagus. Here is an example of a two-step feeding tube placement. On this initial radiograph, we see the feeding tube with the tip terminating just above the level of the carina. This tube appears to be somewhat lateral to the expected margin of the trachea, but to confirm its location within the esophagus, it needs to be advanced and then re-imaged. When the tube is advanced further, we now see that it courses beyond the carina, down below the diaphragm. We also see loops of the catheter within the fundus of the stomach, and this is a feeding tube that has now been advanced into the stomach. Again, placement is unclear until the catheter passes beyond the carina, and sometimes the catheter will not go into the stomach, but instead will go into the left mainstem bronchus or the right mainstem bronchus. Here we have an example of a catheter that was advanced beyond the carina. We can see that the catheter deviates prior to the carina, it deviates to the left, and it does not extend below the diaphragm. This is a catheter coiled within the left lower lobe after intubating the left mainstem bronchus. Here's another example of a catheter which we see take an abnormal course, deviating to the right prior to the carina. On the abdominal film taken at the same time, we see this catheter does not pass below the diaphragm but instead goes into the right lower lobe and in particular, it extends to the periphery of the right lower lobe. A deep catheter like this can sometimes result in a pneumothorax, and when pulling catheters that have reached the periphery of the lung, you should be careful and ready 
for chest tube placement if a pneumothorax occurs. The most severe complication of a deep GI tube like this is the development of a bronchopleural fistula should the catheter have coursed through the bronchi out into the pleural space and leave a large tear in the pleural surface. When you think about nasogastric tubes as opposed to feeding tubes, one important detail is the side hole of the nasogastric tube. The side hole can be delineated on a plain radiograph as a break in the bright white line of the catheter. This side hole needs to be below the gastroesophageal junction for proper function of the nasogastric tube. Here is a commonly seen example of a suboptimally positioned nasogastric tube. Here we see the break in the white line right here, which is above the diaphragm. This catheter needs to be advanced approximately five centimeters for the side hole to go below the gastroesophageal junction. Here is another example. In this case, we see the break in the white line within the fundus of the stomach below the diaphragm. This is a nasogastric tube in ideal position. When placing a feeding tube, multiple coils can often occur within the stomach and this can inhibit post-pyloric placement of the catheter. Here are two examples of feeding tubes coiled within the fundus of the stomach. When a coil forms in the fundus of the stomach, you lose the forward tension that the guide wire can provide and the catheter will often not pass post-pyloric. The pylorus is often the enemy for placement of feeding catheters into the small bowel. At times, the pylorus is either redundant or is not receptive to the catheter. Tubes are often found to be peripyloric or described as peripyloric on abdominal radiographs. That is because the duodenum and the antrum often overlap on a single frontal projection of the abdomen, and therefore precise localization of the tip cannot be made with a single frontal radiograph. Here is an example of a feeding tube where the tip is in a peripyloric location. It's advanced a little bit further, and in this case appears to course retrograde back toward the body and fundus of the stomach. Eventually the catheter is advanced so that the tip is terminating out near the ligament of trites, either in the fourth portion of the duodenum or the proximal jejunum. Again, we see a peripyloric catheter, a catheter which appears to head retrograde within the stomach, and then finally a well-positioned catheter with the tip at the ligament of trap. Once a feeding tube has passed the pylorus and reached the duodenum, it is usually much easier to advance more distally into the duodenum. Here we have an example of a peripyloric catheter with the tip located either in the antrum or the first portion of the duodenum. The subsequent radiograph shows advancement of the catheter down the first and second portion of the duodenum with the tip terminating somewhere near the junction of the second and third portions of the duodenum. This is adequate positioning for feeding in patients who are at risk for aspiration. However, the most ideal placement is for the tip to be at the ligament of trites. This is for two different reasons. One, positioning in the first or second portion of the duodenum places the catheter at risk for retraction into the stomach. And secondly, positioning the catheter tip more distally within the duodenum reduces pancreatic stimulation, which can be important in patients with pancreatitis. Here we have a feeding catheter in excellent position. We see it course down the esophagus into the stomach there are no loops or coils within the fundus of the stomach. The catheter then passes along the C-like configuration of the duodenum, terminating in the fourth portion of the duodenum. This has low risk for retraction and low risk for unnecessary pancreatic stimulation. At times, patients 
duodenum and stomach can overlap, and this can make adequate characterization of the tip difficult in catheters that have coursed all the way to the ligament of trites. To confirm location within the jejunum as opposed to a redundant catheter folded within the stomach, simple contrast injection can differentiate a gastric catheter from an enteric catheter due to the characteristic fold pattern of the jejunum compared to the rugal fold pattern of the stomach. Now let's move on to discuss percutaneous gastrostomy tubes and percutaneous jejunostomy tubes. These tubes are at highest risk for complication if they're disrupted soon after placement because a well-defined tract has not been allowed to mature along the course of the catheter. After the tube has been in place for weeks or even months, a mature tract is often present and disruption of the catheter is low risk for intraperitoneal leak. If a catheter does come loose and it should have a mature track, you would like to replace a catheter within 24 to 48 hours so that the track does not close. Any soft catheter or Foley catheter can be placed into the track to maintain the track until a proper gastrostomy catheter or jejunostomy catheter can be obtained and replaced. Here are two examples of normal percutaneous gastrostomy catheters after contrast injection on the floor. We can see a normal rugal fold pattern within the stomach. We see pooling of contrast within the fundus. And in the lower example, we see contrast extending into the duodenum. While this gives you confidence that the gastrostomy catheter is in the right position, sometimes malpositioned gastrostomy catheters can still fill the stomach due to the presence of a mature tract when the catheter is in the tract but not, does not extend all the way into the stomach itself. Here is an example of a percutaneous gastrostomy catheter injection film. Take a look at this and see what you think about the positioning of the catheter. First, we do see contrast within the tube outlining the tube of the gastrostomy catheter. But instead of seeing contrast pooling within the stomach and normal rugal folds, Instead, we see contrast pooling in the pericolic gutter. This lets us know that we are injecting contrast into the peritoneal cavity and there is malpositioning of the catheter. This is a companion case in which a percutaneous gastrostomy button is located in the subcutaneous tissues as opposed to extending through the abdominal wall and into the body of the stomach. Just to compare normal versus abnormal, again, we see the normal rugal fold pattern of the stomach. We see pooling of contrast in the fundus. Compared to this case where the stomach remains empty and we see pooling of contrast along the pericolic gutter within the intraperitoneal space. Here's an example of a jejunostomy catheter injection. In this case, we see contrast within the tube, and then we see contrast opacifying normal jejunum with a normal jejunal fold pattern. We do not see any pooling of contrast or extraluminal contrast within our field of view. Compare that to this case. Here we again see contrast within the tube of the jejunostomy catheter. We also see normal jejunal mucosal folds, but in addition, we see some areas that don't look like normal jejunum that represents intraperitoneal pooling of contrast. And we can also see contrast coursing away from this abnormal pool tracking into the left upper quadrant. This indicates a leaking jejunostomy too. For comparison, you can see here on the left, normal mucosal folds of the jejunum and no extraluminal contrast compared to the prior case that we had seen where there is abnormal contrast pooling outside of the jejunum. In summary, getting past the epiglottis is key and you want to have the patient actively swallow to overcome the gag reflex and allow for esophageal intubation of the catheter.
when you place the catheter partially into the esophagus or presumed esophageal location, it can be hard to localize the tube on a plain film until it goes beyond the carina. Many protocols have a two-step process where you partially place the catheter, take a chest x-ray, and then place, advance the catheter into the stomach. If you notice a catheter going into one of the bronchi and all the way out to the pleural surface, before you pull that catheter, I recommend you call surgery because pneumothoraces and bronchopleural fistula can result. If you have a dislodged gastrostomy or jejunostomy catheter with a mature tract, try to maintain that tract by placement of a soft catheter in the tract within 24 to 48 hours, and then send the patient for a replacement with a proper gastrostomy or jejunostomy tube. Thank you for your time.